recommendations are coming from. So Amanda, could you go to the navigating change, the state document, please? There we go. So this is the initial draft that the state sent out to us. What I'd like you to notice are the points in blue, or blue, in yellow, there's that curve line that's there. So students in pre-K, fifth or sixth grade should not be required to wear a mask at school. So that was in the third bullet under the health guidelines for masks from the state's initial draft. And then as you scroll down a little bit, they also say very point blank, we recommend that students less than 12 years old should not be required to wear a mask. So th that is where we found our first levels with the mask regulations for um, K-6 and um, then 712 were mandated at level four, level three and four. So now we're going to fast forward to about a week ago and look at the changes that the state has, is now recommending. So in this same section of the document under operations health wearing masks, you will notice that that third bullet with the age ranges is, has completely been taken out. In their appendix, which is the, the next part that, that had the very specific ages in it, if you scroll on down, and I think I have it highlighted in green, it says that there's very limited data in this age group. This is ages nine and under. And essentially they say, we don't know much about this. So they think that we need to kind of watch that. And they go on to say, even a little bit further down, that masks are recommended for all children. And even a little bit further down, that students, children are more likely to respond positively when it's role modeled. And allowing them to have toys, having parents help them pick out a mask, those types of things that parents can help us prepare our children. And they go on to say that they recommend that all students in K-12 schools, and I will note here that I am checking back with KSDE, for them that is all buildings in a school district, so that includes our early childhood center wear an appropriate mask or face covering. So even though they say that there is less data, they're saying that they don't know enough about this to take it out. And they ask us to go with all children will wear a mask. We like our level system and we like having some options. However, what, um, what you will see in our operations document now are some proposed changes to match the state document. And this is in levels two, three, and four. Anywhere where we had a, a kindergarten, we've changed that to pre-K. And we've changed the mask range split to pre-K four instead of the seven, 12, the, the pre-K through six. And we made it pre-K four and then mandatory for five through 12 until you get to level four. And then it, it would be pre-K through 12 to match the state's newest guidelines. Any questions? I'm sorry, Dana. Let me think about this. Um, yes, and then um, Michelle Scholl has also changed that language in her plan to read preschool through 12. So it would be changes in both doc both areas of the document. Dana, what question do you have? I'm sorry. Okay, so what we were given is we first have the old one, right? That says the K seven through twelve or grades K through twelve. Okay. Right. What you're saying is we're now doing it um, recommended or required five through twelve or PK through four. But the PK through four is still up to teacher discretion, right? Yes. Yes, it depends on the, the level, Dana. Linda, can you repeat the okay. question? She asked if the pre-K through four is still teacher discretion. And at the earlier levels, yes, it is. Okay, thank you. It, 
changes, Dana, at level four, and then it is mandated, mass required for all grades pre-K through 12 at level four. But the earlier levels, we've left in that teacher discretion for pre-K through four. Mark and Janine, I don't have you on my screen. So Mark, do you have any questions? I do not, I understand it. I thank you for the presentation. I'm good. Any other questions or comments? I do appreciate that change. I think the last time that we voted during that time, I had read that and felt like that's what they were kind of already indicating. Mm -hmm. um, it still makes me nervous for teachers that have to decide because we have such polarization on this issue. And um, I'm working with an organization where we are running, we're gonna be running preschools and we're gonna have our kids wearing masks. Um, so I feel like, and from what we've heard across the state from other Head Start programs, the kids are doing fine with it. So I still have a level of concern, but I'm really happy to see this change. Yeah. And, and I agree with you, Dana. However, years of uh, spending time in the classroom, I'm used to hearing, well, Miss So and So down the hallway does it different, and I say yes. But when you come through that door into my classroom, this is these are the rules that we're going to follow in my classroom, and hopefully that will be another one of those moments with masks as well. Yeah, I don't worry about the students. I worry about the parents. <laughs> okay. Um, at that, this point, then I would entertain a motion to approve the modifications to the operational levels, classrooms, and district department plans and health services as presented. So moved. Motion by Alex. Is there a second? I'll second it. Seconded by Janine. Second? Laura? Aye. Uh, can we have discussion? Oh, I'm sorry. Discussion. I, I'm sorry, since no one else has said anything, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Jennifer. I was waiting for the motion. Sorry. Um, Thank you. I, because uh, I had more of a comment than a question, so I didn't feel like that was the right time. Do you want to come over to the other yep. microphone? Do you want me to try to repeat my hand, hand please? No, you can try to repeat Dana's thoughts either. Okay. So. <laughs> uh, I, I just wanted to clarify a little bit how I feel like this, feel about this. I'm not in favor of it because I think it's making it even more stricter on an idea that's not necessarily uh, verified and researched enough to be proven true that masks are needed at these lower levels. And I think, um, and I wonder why we even are going over this if we're just going to follow through with the governor's mandate, which I don't think will end in September. Um, so I just, there, there's too many risks on the other side of it. I think there's uh, studies out there that I said earlier that um, the risk of these kids being sent to school in masks that are dirty and have been reused, especially at those lower levels. The kids at the higher levels can speak for themselves more and be able to take it off if they really feel the need to, but I do have concerns about requiring kids in the elementary level to wear masks, and I think it would be more consistent. I know that we have fifth and sixth grade centers, but we also have three schools that are K-6, and I think it would be more consistent for it to be the same for every grade level in that building versus dividing it up. Okay. Any other comments? Thank you for reminding me on the discussion thing for us this year. Second. Laura? Aye. Dr. Hannigan? Aye. Dana? Aye. Janine? Aye. Mark? Aye. Jennifer? Nay. Alex? Aye. Okay, that takes us to school plans, special education. Mr. Diamond? Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't have a whole lot. Uh, when we were looking at our plan and, and administrators started
started working on it, we realized that some of the things that we put in our levels conflicted with what uh, some of the building plans had on their levels. And so the changes I want to make tonight are just to kind of make ours, ours more uniform with theirs. And so, Amanda, can you bring up? You can't? Okay, never mind. Um, under uh, page 86, under the, uh, under the section for self-contained, I would like to remove um, the bullet point that says all enrichment teachers will come into the classroom for level three uh, because in the other classrooms they're doing that at level four. And so I would just do that to line up with what they're doing at level four um, in the classrooms. And then the other, and that's kind of the same thing for um, the next bullet item where we would zoom in the regular ed teachers' presentations for um, story time or inclusion time. I would like to remove that from level three uh, because we have, we have it addressed in level four as well, and it would, it would belong more in level four. And then um, the only other changes that we would like to recommend is on page 91, under self-contained for level four, um, change the wording from Zoom Reg Ed teacher presentation or story time for inclusion time to can Zoom Reg Ed for inclusion time. So that just makes it more broad so that they can get their inclusion time. It doesn't necessarily have to be specific to story time or things like that. We just wanted to make it more broad uh, to give the teachers the opportunity to do that. And then um, for some reason we did not add uh, the piece to Zoom uh, inclusion time for our functional and rise rooms. So we would just like to add it to level four for for that program. And those are the only changes that we have that I would like to propose. Any questions? Dana? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Corner, does it make sense to, I don't, I don't know exactly how to articulate this. Does it make sense for the population of students that you work with to conform to the rest of the plan? Well. Because I really, I really did like your so, so the question uh, Ms. Nanig has is, does it make sense for um, the population of our students to conform to the plan? Um, I think for, for what we're talking about, it, it does because we do want to, it's really important, like our self-contained kiddos are gonna spend the majority of their time in the self-contained classroom with just special education students. And we do want them to have that opportunity to be with typically developing peers because they get a lot of, um, a lot of benefits to that and so, we want to try to get them in those classrooms as much as possible while still being safe while we do that. So you think the benefits outweigh the risks? Yeah, and, and we're kind of doing the same thing. The plan, and it doesn't really line up where we have this. Like our kiddos that are going to resource classes and things like that, um, we don't really restrict their movement until level four. And so we would make it uniform so all those restrictions would be more, they would be more restricted at level four. Okay, thank you. And we've, we've tried to, to make it so that um, they're only going to the specific classroom. So if, if you've got a school like um, Victor and Nelson is a good example, they probably will have uh, four, say four first grade classrooms. We're only gonna identify one to two classrooms that they're gonna go into so that we're not getting exposure across all of them and, and we're being consistent in the classrooms that they're going into. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Um, so at this time, I'd entertain a motion to approve the school plan's special education modifications. So moved. Moved by Dr. Hannigan. Is there a second? Second. Second by Jennifer. Any discussion? Now the yellow box went around Janine, so I was kind of worried for a second. Okay. Um, I'm good. Okay. Stephanie? Laura? Aye. Dr. Hannigan? Aye. Dana? Aye. Janine? Aye. Mark? Aye. Jennifer? Aye. Alex? Aye. Okay, District Department Plans Personnel, Mr. Hogan? Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, so, we, uh, started to articulate our plan and, and visit with uh, different stakeholders about our plan in terms of how to handle leave. So the, the adjustments or edits that I would bring to the board tonight are, are fairly simple and you should have these in your packet. 
I'm the first place in the COVID leave protocol. There's a change that we've added language to um, when we start talking about accommodations that we added another piece of communication in there and it's to approve, have those accommodations approved by HR and their supervisor. So part of this is we need to clear up a process, so it's just for clarity, but clearing up our process on what steps and who needs to be communicated uh, in order to approve those accommodations. It's gonna give us an opportunity to be consistent through the dis district, although we'll be looking at them on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so that was important. Uh, and also, as we started to develop those flow charts, uh, our hope initially was that this is kind of a playbook, if you will, a go-to for not only our supervisors, but also for our staff members. So when you start asking questions about the what ifs, what does it look like when, um, that they would be able to follow those through. So there's that language change to insert uh, approved by HR and their supervisor is really throughout. Um, the biggest portion of those changes happen in the flow chart that's titled leave and accommodation guidelines. Um, we led all those to the second steps. Uh, again, those second boxes where we start talking about accommodations. Uh, additionally, we want to make sure that we have a reporting mechanism for people to return to work. Uh, Pima County Health has been excellent uh, in communicating with our HR office with um, employees who are uh, quarantined, if they're being tested, the results of those tests, uh, and then also return to work date. Um, but we wanted to ensure that our employees know that responsibility if we were to somehow have a breakdown in communication between Pima County Health. So we've added a statement at the bottom of that flowchart as well. And then our uh, travel provisions, there is uh, a section, Dr. Hannigan pointed out or asked the question about where will we be referencing those hotspots. So we've added uh, the KDHE guidelines uh, that's been included so that people know the information that we're using to make those decisions. And actually, there'll be an additional uh, language change according to KDH guidelines will be added to the top of those two boxes out uh, of the top two boxes that are on our uh, COVID travel flow chart. So those are the additions that we would like the board to consider. Any questions? Okay, when you step out and you work with stakeholders, does that include a representative from DPEA? Tell me that again, Dana. When you said that you worked with stakeholders in, in coming up with this, does that include a, rep, a representative from DCEA? The question is, when we talk about working with stakeholders, did that include DCEA? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we worked and we met with DCEA's executive group uh, and talked to them about our plan, uh, what had been approved by the board to handle with classified in our administration, and, and would like to do the same thing. Uh, and so we broke down our negotiated agreements uh, went through potential changes uh, that might be made uh, looking at the language that was used and uh, we feel that uh, the language that's currently in our contract was suitable and there was not a need to have like an additional MOU. Thank you. Yes ma'am. Okay seeing no other questions I'd entertain a motion to approve the district department plans personnel This is Mark, I shall move. Thank you. Mark moves, is there a second? I'll second it. This is Janine. Second by Janine. Any discussion? Okay. Jeffrey, you want to call the roll? Laura? Aye. Dr. Hannigan? Aye. Dana? Aye. Janine? Janine, you're on mute. Sorry, I. Mark. I. Jennifer. I. Alex. I. Thank you. That motion passed. And now, one of the best things on the agenda, KJ, was the discussion of the 2021 district budget. Okay, so at the last meeting, um, I shared a 
with me the proposed budget for the current year. You've had your binders for a little bit of time, and so hopefully you've had a chance to review them. Were there any questions that you didn't get answered as you reviewed the budget binders? Well, I have the easiest job to match. With that, then I'll just give you a quick summary of kind of what the proposed budget looked like. Um, if we look at kind of the two largest factors when I prepared the budget, we did have a slight increase in assessed valuation, and unfortunately we did have a continuing year of declining enrollment. So those two factors put together, combined with a few other factors, mixed all together, put in the oven, and what I came out with for our proposed budget was the result uh, that I presented last time, which would allow the district to maintain the mill levy at 48.8 mills for the fifth consecutive year. We usually do our budget process in three meetings. The first meeting, I present the budget, which was the last meeting. The current meeting, uh, where we answer any questions and our request approval to publish. And the third meeting being a public meeting um, and any public comments uh, regarding the budget would happen at the next meeting. Uh, which is what we currently have scheduled. So, with that being said, um, I would appreciate the board approving the proposed budget for publication. Unless there are any other questions. Any questions? So, at this time, I'd entertain a motion to approve the budget for publication. So moved. Moved by Alex. Is there a second? Second. Was that Jennifer? Sorry. Thank you. Um, any discussion? I have a question. Mark. Uh, yeah, just a quick one. Uh, and my book is here still warm, uh, but I think my laptop was sitting on it. Um, she mentioned that out of the uh, and so that was sort of a, a, a transition. On the four-year-old at-risk fund, um, we're still continuing the funding of 204 year olds uh, at our early childhood center, I presume. And I've mentioned this before, we still have space to continue to do that in our early childhood. At this point, yes, we still do. We are continuing to maximize the amount of space that we Yes, 
sense to push it out a little bit farther than September. So then that way, I mean, part of the reason we schedule it then is so we can see what was going on and how things were going to be going on with the plan at school. Um, and I don't think we're really going to have enough time to look at how everything is going and how things are being affected. Uh, so it would make sense to me to push it out maybe to like October, late October, um, to look at it and say, okay, this is how things are going, being able to evaluate um, and get some feedback at that point. So that's my thought. Anyone else? Agree to move it to October or something? Mark, your thumbs up, was that for an October? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Alex, what are your thoughts? Okay. Dana? That's fine. Jennifer? That's fine. Okay, then can I suggest, a, so we need to have a motion to modify the published meeting list. Do we want to try to come up with a date now, or do you want to send out two or three dates for us to look at? We have provided, I think, not knowing what date you might choose if you elected to move it, a resolution to just eliminate it at this point, and then we could send out dates, and once there's something that works for everybody, that could be noticed as a special meeting, and, and we could do it that way. That might be the cleanest way to do that. Okay. I don't want to take the time to turn my computer on either. So I was going to, and then things went move faster. Um, so is there a motion to, Alex, do you have the resolution in front of you? I know. It's in, yeah. Is it in here? Yeah. So we have a revised resolution to establish regular meeting dates, which lists out all the previous um, meetings that we have had and will have at this point, removing September 10. Is there a motion to approve that? So moved. Moved by Tim. Is there a second? Second by Alex. Second or discussion? Stephanie. Laura. Aye. Dr. Hannigan. Dana? Aye. Janine? Aye. Mark? Aye. Jennifer? Aye. Alex? Aye. Okay, that takes us to, thank you all, to board open discussion. I'm going to start with um, Janine. Sure. Um, I just want to say that I appreciate all of the discussion tonight. Um, I know that a lot of work has been got, has gone into um, putting these plans together and being able to present them. Um, and they've been done with a lot of care and um, support of our students and our uh, staff. And so uh, in questioning and, and making tough decisions on those, um, I don't think I was quite where Dana was on the athletics plan. Um, I had a little bit more confidence in what I felt about it, but um, just because I question it does not mean I don't appreciate all of the work that's gone into it. And um, we have to start somewhere. I think we're doing the best we can to make sure um, students and teachers and other staff are safe. And so I appreciate the, the comments of everybody this evening and the discussion that we were able to have with it. Um, to me, that shows a lot of growth as the board as well, too. So. And that's all I've got. Mark? Uh, nothing really, Madam Chair. Just uh, again, echo that I appreciate all the discussion and heartfelt comments. Uh, it's very helpful. Thank you, Mark. Jennifer? Um, yeah, I, I want to say that I'm encouraged for the plan that the district has put together, but I also feel like that as a board, we need to be looking at what's best for all kids. And I do believe that there is a set of parents and students and staff out there that feels like they're they're more at risk by being forced to wear a mask all day and um, we're, we're at the point where we're still following that government's mandate and I and I I don't think 
for acknowledging our plan as highly as we should, because I think it's a good plan, and I think it's better than what we're being asked to do for the first six weeks or school or however long it is. And I'm afraid that that's not going to end in September. So I think we can continue to look at that and realize that there are risks out there by following her mandate, and that it's not a political thing at all. There are studies out there on both sides, and it was even said that, that it wasn't clear when we lowered um, the mask requirement to the fifth and sixth grade level, that they didn't have enough information to know how it affects kids and what risks they're at. And I really, I uh, was disappointed tonight maybe a little bit that I wasn't supported by my board members more, even though none of you may have voted for my motion, but at least there could have been a second so we could have discussed it more and um, got it out into the open. But um, as a board member, I'm also going to support your decisions, and we voted for our district plan, and to follow that, and I will support that, and I think that um, we just need to keep that in our minds as we go forward in the semester, because I think issues will arise later because of those masks being required. But I do want to thank everybody for the hard work on the plans and how detailed they are and, and uh, the work that's gone into it. Thank you, Jennifer. Dana? Well, I guess to echo um, the other comments, it is really challenging to sit up here and make decisions, um, not thinking of just your own children, but of all the kids and what's best for all the kids. Um, there's this constant bombardment of information um, with all different ideas. Uh, so it's tough. And honestly, I'm a little nervous to go home. My kids will probably not talk to me because they want to play sports. Um, so it's hard as a parent to keep up with the information, try to make the best decisions, but it's even more challenging as a board member to put that personal preferences to the side and try and, and determine what you think is best for all the students. So, um, just in, you know, in repeating what I said, I, I appreciated the plan. Um, I don't necessarily think, uh, honestly, from the data, I don't know one way or the other what, what might be right or wrong, but I guess at the end of the day, you just kind of have to go with your gut. So um, I do appreciate the discussion. I, I always appreciate the work, the time, the effort, and I'm sure you guys are just as stressed, if not more, trying to, to, to figure all this out for our students, so I really do appreciate that. Alex? Dr. Nieder? Um, yeah. First off, I would say, um, in retrospect, I completely agree with Jennifer's point about a second. If I had it to do over again, I would have seconded the motion because it, it did deserve open discussion. I think you and I probably have diametrically opposed ideas about masks. I suppose I suppose in part because I've been wearing one since 1993. Maybe the um, having said that, I was sent an article today um, by a board member related to um, the questioning of masks, and I spent uh, probably two and a half hours on the article including all of the footnotes, three citations of uh, what type of um, quality of resources there are. And it's very laborious, and it's very mind-numbing. Um, but there was a comment made tonight that there's a lot that we don't know. That's true, but there's a lot that we do know. And I don't think the fact that there's uncertainty should be the enemy of the certainty that we do have. And the information is there, it is changing, it does require considerable effort to try to understand it, and uh, um, it's doable. Um, I mean, this may end up being the discussion that you had wanted to refer to a certain degree too, but Dr. Burns did send us a letter from um, the work group with pediatricians and um, 
that she is working with advocating for masks. Um, and just like I think I said earlier, I hope that um, the athletics and the activities people listen to the city and county health department, I want to listen to them as well with the information that they're providing us. And that's the information she provided us with regard to masks. Um, and so I feel comfortable listening to that. And then I've also watched most of, most of the county commission when they were talking about reopening, do we wear masks, what do we do? And listening to Ms. Greaves and Dr. Burns on that issue as well, um, and appreciated all that they had to say. So um, that's kind of where, where I'm at with regard to that issue. Um, I hope I am not overstepping my bounds on this. If I am, hopefully Mr. Perea can throw that empty water bottle that he has. Hopefully it's empty. Um, but I believe tomorrow GCEA is hosting um, the new teachers because the new teachers have started. So welcome to the new teachers um, at lunch here um, at the high school. Um, Mr. Perea, I will be here. So if anyone else, it's, at 11, it's from 11.30 to one. So if you have some time, um, you might consider um, coming down for, for that. Um, I'll be here. I think Dr. Carlin said that he would be here as well. So um, I'm looking forward to that and seeing our new crop of teachers. So, and thank you to GCEA. I know you guys have been working very hard with the administration trying to figure out how COVID impacts our negotiated agreement. Um, so thank you. And um, echoing everyone else, Thank you for the wonderful discussion we've had here tonight. I really have appreciated it. Dr. Carlin. First, I think um, a big thank you needs to go out to all the board members. Uh, it's been it's been said several times about the volume of information that they get about the difficulty of these decisions. And there have been some outstanding comments made tonight. I've been doing this 33 years, and I don't think there's been a more difficult issue that I've seen our schools have to deal with than this. There are, there are people on both sides of the issues around this that are passionate, that are, that are right, they're not wrong. It's not about right and wrong. I've heard from them. I'm guessing that you guys have heard from people on, on all ends of this as well. There's the masks, there's the no masks. There's the let's get our kids back in school right away. There's it's too scary to let our kids go to school. We hear that from staff members, we hear it from parents. We have kids that have apprehensions. We have kids that are excited to get back and just want to have a good, a good school year. I think the hardest part for me is with 7,300 kids and their interests here, there's really gotta be one common path that we take through this. We can't do it 7,300 different ways. And to make that happen, We've got to have people willing to compromise and sacrifice. And I think that was one of the comments that was made by a board member tonight. That's not easy to do when you're passionate about something. We're working hard to make the common denominator in this be students have a successful year. We do have a lot to learn. There are things that we know, and we use that to guide what our plan is and what our decision making will be. But nobody, nobody knows what our world is gonna look like in six months. Again, I wanna thank you for your thoughtfulness, for your candor in dealing with this difficult issue and doing it in a respectful way. It's not easy. And when we leave here, we're still gonna hear from people on both sides of this. 
we're still going to have the uncertainty of have we made the right decisions? Are we poised to do this as well as possible for our kids? I believe that our staff will get behind this. Yes, we have some challenges ahead of us, but I think we have great people who will accept that focus of what's best for kids and will continue to use that as we as we move through the coming months in getting kids back to school and having as, as having that amazing school year. Every year I challenge our staff, let's make this the best year ever in Garden City Public Schools. And I think there's no reason why we can't do that again this year. I wanna just share a couple of things with you as we are just kind of getting started with this. We have probably about 400 of our 1,300 employees back to work. Over the next week or so, uh, President Boers mentioned that our new teachers uh, started uh, last Friday. Um, our veteran teachers come back on Thursday. So that number is gonna grow a whole bunch in the next week. But with 400 out of 1,300 employees back to work, so far we've had one employee request an accommodation due to COVID. We've had nine employees who have missed work due to symptoms of COVID. We've had 10 employees who have been tested for COVID. We have three that have tested positive. We have 15 who have been quarantined for some period due to COVID. And to this point, we have issued or approved 55 days of COVID leave for employees who have been affected by this. As you can imagine, those numbers are gonna change when we get staff members, more staff members back and we bring kids back to school. I, I still firmly believe that we will be able to handle that that we will make the necessary adjustments and that our plan will allow us to fulfill our goal, which is kids back in school as normal as possible with taking reasonable safety precautions. I can't tell you a month from now what level we'll be at, but I can tell you I feel confident in the people that I work with and that will be working with us in this community to make sure that we have our kids in the best possible environment and our staff, and we're taking the appropriate safety precautions. Thanks again for your dedication and commitment to this. I know it's not easy. Um, it's the right and wrong answers don't just jump out at us, but the conversations that and the process that we had in meetings like tonight, I think deliver for us the best answer for our community and for our kids. So thank you for your dedication, your time and your effort serving in these public offices. I would like to thank you, Dr. Carlin, and everyone else who's still here for your dedication to our kids and all the efforts that you've put forth trying to help guide us, trying to find the best answers out there even though answers aren't always out there so thank you okay um this is a little bit of a change um, from what's printed for the next board meeting um, the next board of education meeting will take place on monday august 24th 2020 at 6 p.m and it's actually going to be here again at the garden city high school auditorium 2720 buffalo way garden city kansas that way um, we have this area reserved. Um, and since we have to publish where we're having the public hearing for the budget, just in case there's something else that comes up or um, a lot of people wanna come and comment on our incredible budget, um, there's plenty of room for social distancing. So um, I hope you don't mind that I just made that change. Um, at this time, I would accept a motion to adjourn. I'll take Dr. Hannigan as the move and Jennifer as the second.
Um, do you want a roll call, Stephanie, or discussion on the journey? <laughs> Laura? Aye. Dr. Harrigan? Aye. Dana? Aye. Janine? Aye. Mark? Uh, aye. Jennifer? Aye. Alex? Aye. Okay, thank you all. See you in a couple of weeks.